Good morning and welcome to this week's edition of Encompass Live. I'm your host, Krista Porter, here at the Nebraska Library Commission. Encompass Live is the Commission's weekly webinar series where we cover a variety of topics that may be of interest to libraries. We broadcast the show live every Wednesday morning at 10 a.m. Central Time, but if you're unable to join us on Wednesdays, that's fine. We do record the show every week, as we are doing right now, and it will be posted to our archives for you to watch at your convenience. And I'll show you at the end of today's show how you can navigate in our archives. Both the live show and the recordings are free and open to anyone to watch. So please do share with your friends, family, neighbors, colleagues, anyone you think might be interested in any of the topics we have on our show, any of our upcoming topics, as you can see our upcoming schedule there, or any of our um, archived sessions. Ah, there it is. I hadn't didn't have the screen up. Um, there's our webpage. So um, we do a, a variety of things here on Encompass Live on the show. We, uh, for those of you who might be um, watching from, not from Nebraska, we, um, the Nebraska Library Commission is the state agency for libraries in Nebraska, like your state library. And we provide services to all types of libraries uh, across the state. So you will find things on our show for publics, academics, K-12s, um, corrections, uh, special libraries, archives, et cetera, et cetera, anything. All really our only criteria is that it's something to do with libraries, something that libraries are doing, some cool things we think they should be doing. Um, we bring in guest speakers from around the state and around the country sometimes. And we sometimes have library commission staff that do presentations. Today, you're gonna to be hearing from me. I'm doing today's presentation. Um, but before we jump into today's show, I just wanna give my, uh, I've been doing this reminder every week just so everyone is on top of things. I'm gonna pop over here. This is our main Library Commission website and we are still in the height and of the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, most recent news is we are working towards the second wave. Uh, things are going to go only get um, worse um, up uh, as, as we go into the fall and the winter. So here on the Library Commission's website, we are trying to gather resources to help our libraries. We have a post here pinned to the top of the page. It's always will always be here on top of our new posts um, with resources for libraries. We have a list that we are attempting to maintain for libraries across the state. Are, are they open? Are they closed? Uh, special accommodations, um, curbside pickup, Wi-Fi in the parking lot. Parking lot. Uh, some libraries we know um, who have opened are now reclosing again because there have been new outbreaks in their areas. So reclosings. <laughs> um, so keep an eye on that. If you are a Nebraska library, um, let us know here at the commission if we need to update our information about you. Our library resources that we have here, we have um, a link where you can um, update our list, some maps, but here's where we have a link to some specific resources. Um, this is the things you can use in your library to help your people who may be coming in. Unemployment, homeschooling, businesses, what to do. Um, but the second set option here specifically I want to bring your attention to is about your library. Um, what um, resources, webinars, um, just any sort of information we, we know that is out there. Things from the CDC, World Health Organizations, ALA, OCLC, youth, um, uh, IMLS, et cetera, et cetera. Um, anything we find, we are always adding to this page as well. So keep an eye on here for new information that you may, um, that we may be providing as information specifically for schools, um, information about hosting meetings, your board meetings. This is specific to Nebraska. If you are not a Nebraska library, check your state's rules and regulations. Um, examples of policies of libraries who are working, have reopened, how they did it. Um, health, uh, online resources, et cetera, et cetera. So we try to keep this up to date, um, keep an eye on it as um, time goes on for any other resources we may add to it. Um, as I said, this is the Nebraska Library Commission's page. A lot of this information is general, could be um, for anybody, but if you are not a Nebraska library, check with your state library or your state library association and see if they may be providing the same resources and information for you. So let's get into today's uh, show then. Yay, there we go. There it is. All right. So today I'm going to be talking to you about E-Rate. 
um, E-Rate 101, just the basics. Um, here at the Library Commission, in addition to hosting um, this show, uh, I am the Library Development Director. Um, I am also the State E-Rate Coordinator for Public Libraries in Nebraska. That means I handle all of the training, education, um, hand-holding, whatever you, you may need here in Nebraska to get through the E-Rate process. I do do um, workshops, longer workshops in the fall on E-Rate, uh, about th longer, like three-hour sessions, and I will be doing that again later um, coming up. We have not scheduled the workshops yet. That's still to come, but I wanted to get some information out to you if you were uh, wanting to know about E-Rate at least. Um, so this will be just a very um, more uh, quick overview just for this one hour, 45 minutes hour that we are here for, but the real basics of just how the process works. So um, this will be some repetition for some of you who may have done E-Rate before, some some new information, um, but it's always good to, re to have a refresher. E-Rate is um, a great program to use to get on top of, but does take some education and learning about it. So this is going to be the basics. Look for my announcements for when I have my longer workshops. The workshops that we were doing this year, I used to, I usually go around the state to various locations so everyone can attend. We will, for safety purposes, we will not be doing that this year. I will be doing online workshops, the longer three-hour workshops, two and a half, three-hour workshops with going through step-by-step step how to uh, do each form. Those um, we will be doing, I will be doing multiple sessions of those as well. I always have done an online one after my in-person ones, but I'm going to be doing um, multiple online ones at various times and days so that everybody can have a chance to um, attend when it's convenient for them. And then we'll have the ability to ask me questions live if they want to. So look for those recording of those uh, shows to be coming up and be announced that shows workshops. <laughs> so let's just get into today's session, E-Rate, the basics. So E-Rate is a federal program uh, do, done by the FCC, Federal Communications Commissions, and this is their official um, mission statement, so that's why they're in quotes, uh, to ensure that schools and libraries can obtain high-speed internet access and telecommunications at affordable rates and keep students and library patrons connected to broadband by providing a discount on eligible services. So this is a FCC federal program that gives discounts to schools and libraries on anything related to getting your internet. So this would be your actual monthly internet costs, uh, construction to get that internet connected, and any sort of equipment you might need to keep that internet working in your library. The funding for this, serve, this program comes from the universal service fee. This is something, if you check your phone bill, uh, your cell phone bill, or your cable bill, or your internet bill, uh, with all those different taxes and, and fees that you have to pay, there's something there that will be called the Federal Universal Service Free USF fee. Different companies may abbreviate it differently. But we, as customers of these services, and the telecommunications companies that provide the services pay in um, a little tax for this, and it is all um, gathered up to then help help schools and libraries be able to, af um, to afford their internet services. So as I said, the FCC is the um, US government agency that runs the program. They set all the rules and all the policies. So whenever we are doing anything with E-Rate and everything cha anything changes in, in a year, we're waiting on them for direction and guidance and orders on what to do. Uh, uh, when they first created the program, which was in the mid 90s, 1996 was the Telecommunications Act, and that was what in, it created the E-Rate program. And the Universal Service Administrative Company, USAC, was um, created as a non-profit, non-profit to not-for-profit to run the day-to-day, -day, um, the day-to-day -day running of the E-Rate program. They actually run the E-Rate program and three other programs programs to give discounts to um, healthcare facilities, to help people who are low income, and to help people in very high cost areas where it's very difficult to get internet access to. So they have multiple programs they run. The one that we're con in concerned with being in libraries is the schools and libraries division part of USAC. Um, e is uh, generally considered an abbreviation potentially. I'm not sure if it's official for education. So everything that has to do with getting this service to and these discounts to schools has education related and to libraries is 
um, libraries are included in that because they do provide education, but um, any kind of resources that they provide that are based in the internet. Uh, most of the time we talk about USAC when we're talking about E-rate. USAC is doing this, USAC is sending you an email, um, you need to reach out to USAC about something um, related to your E-rate. Uh, E-rate is given out on a funding year. This is how they run the program. So every, every and the funding year runs every cycle from a, a July 1st to a June 30th of the next year. So whenever you are applying for E-rate, you're always looking to the future. You're, right now is when you can actually start the process and we'll get into the specifics of that. But you are thinking of in July of 2021, I want to start receiving, I want to have these discounts. So this is what you're working on right now. What the discounts you're receiving right now, you were working on last, started working on last fall. So it's an it's ongoing process every year, um, but you're always a one year at a time. So for funding year 2021 is the next one that we'll be that we would be talking about that you'd be looking into, and that runs from July 1st, 2021 to June 30th, 2022. There is almost $4 billion available usually in this program. It is adjusted for inflation regularly, so there is a lot of money out there. And this is money that is specifically designated for this purpose, just to give discounts to schools and libraries on their internet-related charges. Um, it is not something that can go somewhere else or be used for something else in the federal government. So it's just out there waiting for you to apply for and ask for it for your library. Um, all libraries, all public libraries in Nebraska are eligible for this program. Um, the criteria from USAC and the FCC is they must is that you must be eligible for LSTA fundings. And here, in, and this varies from live from state to state. So this is just Nebraska. Other states, if you happen to watch my session here, check with your state. But here in Nebraska, we consider all public libraries eligible for services and programs that are funded by LSTA funds. So then you are all eligible for uh, E rate. Um, our schools and school districts are all eligible, and if we did have consortia where groups of entities that got together to share costs, those consortia could, could apply as a group as well. Uh, how much can you receive uh, as a discount on your services? This is a range. Um, this will depend. Um, anywhere from 20% is the lowest, <coughs> excuse me, um, up to 90%. And this depends on uh, a couple of criteria. The main number that you look at for a library is the children in your school district that are eligible for the school lunch program. This is the free and reduced lunch program at your school. So wherever your library is physically, geographically located, whatever that school district is, is the numbers that you would look at. Now you may serve kids that come in from neighboring school districts just because of where people live and go geographically and that's fine but for e-rate purposes they just say where does your library library live where is it actually physically look at that school's numbers um, and you as you can see here for whatever reason you can't include include the pre-k numbers so just kindergarten through 12th grade uh, once you know that number then you also look to see if whether your lab your area is considered urban or rural here in nebraska most of us are considered rural <laughs> Um, which gives us a little bump up on some of the discounts. And here's the specifics of how you can find these numbers and calculate this for yourself first. For libraries who are new to E-rate or wondering about should I even get involved in doing this, I recommend you do this yourself ahead of time before you even start submitting forms. Find out how much of a discount you could potentially receive to see if it is worth it for you to go through all the work that it takes to um, apply for and maintain E-rate. Um, E-rate is a ongoing process. There's forms that you submit at different times throughout the year and you do it every year. So it is a regular thing you have to keep up on. Um, I'm here to help you keep up on that, but it does take some legwork on your side. So if you're not sure, I recommend you do this. We are very lucky here in Nebraska that our Department of Education posts the data about the school lunch numbers, the um, school library, national library program, uh, lunch program, sorry, <laughs> on their website. And I've got a link right there where you can go to look at it. It's also linked off the E-rate page that I maintain here at the Library Commission. So you can go there. It has a spreadsheet that pops up and it has a tab on that spreadsheet for the school districts, each school districts. So all of the, you want you need to look at all the schools in the districts if you've got elementary, middle, high schools and multiple ones, what's the grand total? So you can go there and find your um, number of children that are in the program. And what's the key here too, I'm gonna go back a, a screen. It is, this is number of students that are eligible for the program, not necessarily that participate. 
And that can be a big difference. There are many, there are families that don't feel the need to participate in the program um, for just, you know, we're actually doing fine, we don't need it. Um, there are families that for this, do the stigma don't do it for whatever reasons, but that's not what these numbers are that the school district is even putting out. This is just the numbers of children that happen to be eligible, not who are participating. Um, so that's a key there. Then you'd look up and see if you're rural or urban. Um, USAC has a tool where you can look up your um, area and find out what you are. This is based on census data, the most recent census from 2010. After this census that we're doing right now is done and whatever comes of it, uh, they will most likely update to that information. Um, the FCC cutoff between urban and rural is 25,000 population. So populations of 25,000 or more are considered urban, under 25,000 are rural. That's almost everywhere in Nebraska, except for our large cities like Lincoln, Omaha, et cetera. Um, once you have those two items, then you go to the USAC's discount matrix to look up your discount. And there it is. It's also on their website. So you see what is the percent of children eligible. That's from the Department of Education. It's in their spreadsheet, that percentage. And then are you urban or rural and see how much of a discount you can get. Um, you'll see here there's different categories of service, category one and category two, and I'm going to explain that in a minute here. But you can see here, if you only have half of the kids in your school are eligible, 50%, you can get an 80% discount on your services. That's huge. If it's just less, it goes down 60, 70. So most libraries in Nebraska fall between the 60 and 80% discount rate for um, all their services. So uh, definitely could be a benefit for you if you're willing to you know, keep up with and do the work for it. So what is e-eligible? What is e-rateable? I don't know if that's a real word. I, I invented that for my purposes here. Um, but every year, the FCC publishes what they call their eligible services list, the ESL. Um, so there's a new list every year. So depending on what year you're applying for or looking at information about, you need to look at the correct list. Um, I've got a link on our website that goes right to the current list. Well, the page where they have the list. Uh, sometimes you are working on multiple years at the same time. So if USAC is asking you questions about last year's application, like the 2021, you got to make sure if they're looking at eligible services, you look at the 2020 list. Um, if you're applying for next year, you look at the 2021 list. Sometimes the lists change. They add things to it. They remove things. They did some a lot of streamlining of it over the last um, about four or five years ago. So it's it's really easy to work with now. Um, new services, new technologies, you know, are created and invented and they may need to tweak the wording in the list for you know, new ways people can get internet. The services are split up between two categories, category one, category two. Category one gets the service to your building, the high, whatever the high speed internet services you have. Category two makes that, that internet service work throughout the building. So you can think of the difference also between category one and two is this here is the, the wall of the building, the bricks there. Category one is what it brings to the building outside. And then once it's in there, all that equipment you need, modems, routers, servers, switches, access points, et cetera, et cetera, racks, cables, I didn't put everything on here, but anything that in all that physical equipment inside your building, once you have the internet line coming in that you need to then make all of those devices be able to use the internet, your PCs, laptops, come, people coming with their own um, wireless phones, um, printers, et cetera. Those particular devices themselves, the cost of those isn't eligible, it's just the service to, that they will use. So you've got your one and your two. Category, anybody have any questions? Don't forget, type them into the questions section. Let me just double check my, there we go. I'm gonna get that open so I can see if anybody ever has anything that pops up there. All right, so category one, is as i said anything that gets the internet into your building um, and this is anything any sort of connection you have that provides any sort of high speed broadband internet service so if you have cable if you have dsl fiber um, satellite wireless whatever is getting the service to your library and this is not an exhaustive list this is just some examples of some of the ones that are on there uh, when you are looking at your e-rate forms they'll show you all these options of the different kinds of ways you potentially get um, your internet service to the building. 
Uh, a little information here about fiber. Uh, you'll notice it did mention lit and dark fiber. Those are both possibilities for you if you're working on getting fiber. Um, fiber lines when um, the reason we have lit and dark is when fiber lines were first installed, so to speak, if they came through your town or near your area and dug trenches and laid fiber underground, they always put in more lines, more fiber um, connections than they actually need at the time. They thought for thinking for the future. So um, they the lines that aren't needed yet, the connections that aren't needed yet are not turned on right away, so they are called dark fiber. They're in there, they're in the ground, somebody owns it, um, your service provider, the company that is running it, but they just need to flip a switch and however they work that and turn it on so that you can use it. Lit fiber is already out there and ready to use and you're just trying to find someone to use that. Uh, so those are both options are available. Uh, we recommend uh, asking when you're doing your e-read application, say we'd like either one because you never know what might be out there. There might be some dark fiber hiding around somewhere that you just need to let someone know. We'd love to have that if you do this e-read deal with us. Um, they do, um, you see here, there's rules that if you are wanting to look into dark fiber, you also have to ask for lit as well. So there is a combo uh, option to say least dark and least lit all as one, one deal. So it makes it nice and easy for you to pick that and say, this is what we're looking for. And just putting a feeler out to see what's out there. Uh, under category one, two is a um, special deal that they have, a special situation called special construction. Uh, many areas still need new fiber run to them and all of this construction work done outside the building you can receive an e-rate discount on so this is any cost if you are getting fiber for the first time so this is new fiber if you already have fiber and you're just upgrading getting faster speed that's not what this is that's just your regular but special construction um, any actual physical if they have to dig new trenches to run lines to you install anything um, Whatever work needs to be done with managing the project for you can be you can receive a, a, an e-rate discount on it because they know they understand that not all companies and all construction can work just in that tight e-rate funding year of July through June. They do allow you to start this work actually up to six months before the official funding year starts, so January. So for next year, if you're thinking about doing this as an option of having a new fiber line run to your library, you can talk to the, the your company and say, it's okay if you need to start construction in March, April, May, whatever, our E-rate discount will still apply for that special construction, even though the funding year, when the service starts in July, um, that, that's when the service starts, the construction could would need potentially need to be done ahead of time. Now, I mentioned this also because here in Nebraska, we have a, a new opportunity available to, you, to libraries. Uh, as part of the E-rate modernization that they did um, about four or five years ago, updating and expanding and making E-rate hopefully easier, they created a um, state matching fund, state matching for special construction. If a state was able to come up with extra funding to help pay for some of this work, E-rate would match that funding as well and add even more of a discount onto a library's costs for having this special construction done. Um, over the years, about 20, over 20 other states have done this, this state matching um, fund. And just this year, we finally here in Nebraska have a, are offering it as well. So this will, if you do do special construction and apply for it, then E-rate we at the state we will give you a little extra discount on your on your on your E-rate, and E-rate will match that. And I'll give a little more. This is in using numbers. I think explains this a lot better to me. <laughs> so, for example, you've gotten a bid from a provider to run fiber to your library, and it's going to cost a nice round hundred thousand dollars. I do the make easy math here, and you have eighty percent discount on your E-rate. Um, Right off the bat, your basic E-rate, you get 80% off, so the library is responsible for, to start with, um, if it was just a basic E-rate, $20,000 $20, of that. Um, our state matching fund would com contribute 10% of that, which is $10,000, and then E-rate will match the state match, adding another 10% off, in effect, making the library's cost zero. So there's this project of $100,000, 
E-rate covers 80%, our state matching fund covers 10%, and then E-rate says, because your state is helping you and supporting you with this project, we're gonna toss another 10% discount on that too. Now, if, and so that's like, we get fiber run to the library for at no cost to the library or the city. Now this is at an 80% discount and with this nice pretty math, of course, if your E-rate discount is you know, less than that 70, 60, you would still have to pay some, but you will get a lot of help from the state and from E-rate to make your discount ultimately come out even higher. And here's just the math um, there, cost 80% state match, E-rate match. Now, how this is happening here in Nebraska is, uh, a few years ago, the governor created a uh, Nebraska broadband task force to investigate how to make better, do better with internet in, in the state. This is for everything, not just for libraries or schools. This was for across the board, um, agriculture, schools, personal, business, everything. Part of that was part of this report that was um, submitted to the governor just last fall uh, was about the Nebraska Public Service Commission um, helping put out funding for to create this state matching program in Nebraska. The Public Service Commission here in Nebraska, uh, I mentioned, I explained at the very beginning how E-rate has a universal service fund where we all pay into it to provide this service, these, these discounts to everybody around the country. Here in Nebraska, we actually have our own Nebraska universal service fund run by the Public Service Commission. So here we pay another little extra tax, to a fee, that goes to Nebraska, to the Public Service Commission, and they have uh, their own programs where they offer discounts to schools, libraries, healthcare facilities, et cetera. So we have our own local program as well for the state, um, which um, helps out all these areas even more. They have budgeted uh, $1 million right now. They have put up $1 million that can be used starting in 2021 and over the next four years for the E-rate fiber special construction. So if you are interested in doing this, you don't have fiber, you would apply for your E-rates uh, this year for 2021. Uh, doing a 470 saying we want to do this. Uh, we we will help you here at the Library Commission to create a request for proposal, an RFP. You do have to have a special document that explains what you're doing. Um, I'm helping out. I'm doing the work on the E-rate side and Holly Wolt, who is our technology person here at the Commission, can help you with your um, RFP if you're interested in that. Um, you'd submit your um, 470 uh, to E-rate and then in December, by December, you submit a separate application to the Public Service Commission saying we would also like to receive the uh, special matching state funds. Uh, the deadline to submit that is in mid-December. They haven't put out a specific date, but on their website, and we have links to this off of our website too, and if you, if you need information from us on it, they have an application that you then say, okay, I've done my 470, and I've picked who I want as my provider to do this, or this work. Now I'd like to get your funding as well as a match. Um, by sometime in January, the public commission says they will um, make their decision and let you know if they're um, approving your application to do that. Then you can continue with your next step in the E-rate process and do your second form uh, telling USAC, yes, we would like to do this and we have the state match so that E-rate knows to add that extra match onto um, your discount when they do, do the, um, finish that all up for you. So if you are interested in this, definitely reach out to me, reach out to Holly Wolt here at the Library Commission, and we can help you um, learn more about it. We did do some workshops and trainings on that over the last couple of months as well. So there is some recordings and information about their, out there, uh, separate specific special trainings just for this uh, state uh, match special construction fund. Um, after the construction is done is when you receive the reimbursement um, of the cost. That's how the uh, state will be doing that for you as well. So look into that. Any questions about category one before we pop over into category two? All right. So category one is getting your internet service to the building. Category two is once you have that service, how do you make it work? So all the equipment you might need um, to run that. So as I said, cables, firewalls, networks, routers, racks, power supplies, any uh, work needed to be done to install all of this, all of that, all of those costs you can receive an E-rate discount on. Um, in addition to the equipment itself, 
basic maintenance of these con these connections as well. So um, if oops, on that, uh, if you have someone that you contract with to do your upgrades or fix something when it go when it breaks, uh, put in new cabling if it goes bad, uh, upgrade your network software, all of that kind of work as well. So the, it's not just the initial purchase of this equipment, but the maintenance and keeping it working and in good working sh uh, shape is also eligible for E-rate discounts. If you're not sure what you have in your closet, so as you can see here, this picture I have here is actually a pretty nice, a very neat uh, <laughs> picture of someone's network closet with, all, closet with all the cables nicely wired up and clean. Uh, not everybody's closet looks like that. Not everybody's network connections look like that. And you might not even know, what do I have? What do I need to update? What, what can I do? Uh, we recommend using this, the Toward Gigabit Libraries Toolkit. Um, Holly here at the Library Commission, who I've already mentioned, um, and Tom Rolfus, who's staff at the CIO's office here in Nebraska, worked to help get this um, project out there. It's a free resource out there. Um, IMLS, Institute of Museum and Library Services, funds it. And it is a really slick toolkit where you can just go in there, enter into this document, all of whatever's in your closet, and it will tell you what you might need to update. How good is it? Could you get a faster speed? Um, it'll put together an improvement plan for you and saying, well, you've got this router, you might want this one instead, here's a newer model, all that kind of information. So this is kind of give you a nice guide and a, and a um, plan for what do I have and what can I do to improve it. Uh, you could do this yourself if you have a tech person who works with you, they could help out. And as you can see here, it is really designed for people who don't have tech support. Um, we have a lot of libraries in Nebraska and a lot of our libraries in, across the country, small rural libraries, don't have extra, don't have a computer person, don't have a techie guy. <laughs> and this is specifically for that kind of library. So it will help you go through that process. We have a link to it off of our E-rate page and our broadband support pages here at the Library Commission. So if you're wondering what do I apply for, what is what do I need under category one? What kind of internet connection do I need under what do I need under category one for internet connection? What kind of equipment I might need? This can help you figure all that out and get a handle on what is is happening at your library internet related. <clears throat> now for category one, um, you have an unlimited amount of money you can ask for. Whatever you buy, whatever internet service you have, you just get whatever that percentage discount off of whatever it is that you're paying for. Category two, for all that equipment, everything inside the building works a little differently. Uh, for category two, USAC gives you a budget to work with. So similar to your, your regular budget you get from your municipality, it's, and I try to describe it as more of like a, it's an, it's an idea. It's a, uh, it's not actual money that they say, here's the whole budget we're going to say, here it is, go and spend it. It's more just a calculation of what they think you could, you um, should spend over the next five years. Um, They're doing it now in five year uh, increments. So they calculate a budget, as you can see here, for that you can use from 2021 through 2025. And then I'll do it again, 2026, 2030, et cetera, et cetera, forward, going forward. So for 2021 is when you can start using this new budget. And you don't have to use it all up that year. You can use it throughout those five years. You might only have certain things you want to buy in 2021 and other equipment you'll buy next year. And then the year after that, you finally upgrade your internet speed. So then that will mean you need to do something then. So you get a cost for that year. Um, they it's fixed for that entire five year period. This is some these are some changes from what it was before 2021. And they only adjust for inflation at the very beginning of the year of the five years, not every single year. So they'll you'll get an amount at the beginning of 2021 and that's it through 2025. Um, you will only receive discounts up until you've used up that budget. You're welcome to spend more. You don't you're not limited to only saying it like if you, you say you're given a budget of $50,000 and your costs end up going over that, you don't have to stop spending things at $50,000. It's just that you only receive an E-rate discount up to that $50,000. If you need more services and projects above that, that's fine. You, you can keep buying. It's just you'll only receive E-rate up to whatever your budget is. <clears throat> now, how much is it? How much am I going to get for this? Uh, for 2021 through 25, they, um, for libraries, they calculate this based on the size of your building, the total area in square feet. Um, this is all the floors, um, 
all your walls. So you need to probably, if you don't know exactly how many square feet you have in your building, I might need to look at uh, blueprints or talk to somebody in the city or someone who knows what's the size of our building. Um, and they just take that and they multiply it by um, the amount they figured this year it, for this five year period is $4.50, so 450. But there is a minimum budget of 25,000. So at a minimum, everybody gets 25,000 to use over that five year period. Depending on how big your library is, you might get more if your, your amount, your space goes above that. Um, you can, this budget can be recalculated if your building does change. For example, we know a lot of new libraries are being built. So if you move to a different library, a different um, physical building, and now it's a different size, you'd give, you exact that number so they can adjust your budget. Um, if you add an addition onto the library, expand, uh, hopefully you don't go smaller, but if you do, you'd have to update it as well, and then your budget would go down if you go to a smaller building. So here's specific math to make you really understand it. Uh, your library is a, has um, a total of 3,500 square feet. 3,500 times 450 is 15,750, but there's a $25,000 minimum budget for everybody, no matter what. So since your calculation is less than that, you actually get 25,000. If your library was bigger and the amount came out above 25,000, you'd get whatever that was. Um, in this case for this library, also just doing nice clean math, um, their discount rate is 50%. So you'll actually get 12,500 in funds to spend on category services, category two services for the next five years. So you are given this budget, this kind of amorphous, here's your budget, but the rate still has discount rates. You, you're, you'd only get whatever your discount is. In this one, in this case, 50%, you've got 12,500 that they'll give you. When you're doing your E-rate applications, as you buy things, there will be a place in your account where it keeps track of what your budget is, keeps track of what you've applied for discounts on, and will, will automatically delete, deduct from that as you're going through, um, through the years and um, until you've used it all up, or the five years are over and you start again with a new budget. All right. All right. Any questions about category two? It is a little confusing. Um, I think uh, I like that they've um, they've raised the minimum budget, so you have a lot more money to work with. Uh, definitely look into it, though. If you're looking about a lot of libraries, just apply for their monthly e-rate and monthly internet costs, that category one, and that's all. But look at your equipment. If you could get something at 50, 60, 70, 80 percent off and you've got this money to use, might as well use it. And if you want to know more, you need more help with what is my equipment, what do I have, what should I upgrade, Holly here at the commission, Holly Wolt, who I mentioned already, you can reach out to her and she's the person who we've got here now in charge of uh, evaluating and checking out what you have and giving you advice on what you might want to upgrade to based on what you currently have. And that would be this category two type services. All right. So one other thing you do have to pay attention to in E-Rate is SIPA compliance. Um, and you may have heard of this. SIPA is a Children's Internet Protection Act. There we go. Um, and this is to, the purpose of this act is to protect children from um, unsavory things on the internet, uh, porn, violence, et cetera, et cetera. In order to receive E-rate discounts, because it is a federal monies, you do have to be in compliance with SIPA for anything you're applying for, your internet access and your internal connections, internal connections being all that category two uh, equipment that you might purchase. There's not very much that goes into complying with SIPA. Some things you possibly already have. An internet safety policy. Uh, there's only three things. Internet safety policy what can or can't people do on the internet and when they're on their your computers using the internet you probably have possibly have some sort of policy about patron behavior already this may be part of that as long as you have something somewhere you're good um, the technology protection measure the filter itself so this is about filtering so whatever kind of for a filter you have they do not specify what filter to buy what it needs to um, actually no specifics about it needs to block this list of sites or these particular things it's a very vague just it needs to be on there and blocking something and then at some point have had a public notice or announcement possibly most likely through your board, a board meeting a public board library board meeting about the fact that you were doing this um, some libraries have done all this and you're already good to go uh, you might need to look into it and that's okay uh, some libraries may have got the policy in there or have your policy have your filter on but never thought about having a public meeting 
schedule something in an upcoming board meeting so that people know, hey, just updating you all that this is something we do. Um, there's information on the USEC website all about it as well on our E-rate webpage, uh, which I'm going to give you the link to late in the end of the show too. We do have some information about just um, how to pick a filter. We don't recommend any necessarily any particular ones. It's just too uh, too many variables for us to say here's the one that everybody should use. But we have lots of resources on our page about that. So in order to receive E-rate discounts, you do need to be in compliance with it. Now. Onto the actual forms themselves and how to do your E-rate. So that's all the basics of how the program works and, and what goes into it and what you need to know about what you can get. Here's how you actually do it. There are three forms that everybody does every year with only a few uh, modifications. And then the last form there under where it is invoicing, it would depend on how you receive your, your discounts, how you do that. Uh, your first form is the 470, where you are telling companies, I want a service, and you're opening up a competitive bidding process saying, hey, who wants to provide me with this service or these, this equipment? Second form, your 471, you tell USAC who you picked to provide the service or the equipment. And then the 486, you tell USAC they've started giving me the service, the service has started or received the equipment. And then the invoicing, depending on if you're receiving a discount on your bills or uh, a reimbursement after the fact. And we're gonna go into the specifics of each of those. So you've got three forms, those first three, 470, 471, 46, everybody has to do. The last one, it will depend. Now, how do you submit all of these? E-Rate has an online interface for everything now. The E-Rate Productivity Center, acronym is EPC, but it's pronounced EPIC. So in EPIC is where you do all this. With um, most recent update they did to the um, EPIC system, they have this new, and I'm gonna show you how it works, this new two-factor authentication, extra security. It appears to, at the moment, only be working in Chrome and Firefox. So I've had, actually, just this week, multiple libraries, had a couple of libraries that contacted me had been using Safari, which had worked previously, and it did. Safari, IE, other browsers did work, but with this new authentication, they don't appear to be having it working successfully with anything but Chrome or five uh, Chrome or Firefox. So you just have to make sure now you're using one of those. And this is a one-stop shopping for all of your E-rate activities that you may need to do. You can submit your forms, check up on your status. Um, if E-rate has questions to you, they will reach out to it there. You can ask E-rate questions. And that's the URL there to get to the main page for it. Pretty easy, usac.org slash E-rate with that at, um, hyphen in there. So to log in, E-Rate will create an account for your organization. They would already have one in there and will identify one person to be the account administrator. Usually that's a library director. If you don't have one, you just can call USAC and they will set one up for you. You will probably have to provide them. If you're brand new to E-Rate and have never done anything with it before, um, provide them with some sort of just official documentation that yes, I am the library director. Yes, we are a library and we'd like to start doing this. Uh, the account administrator can add additional users if you want. If you're lucky enough to have other staff that you might want to pawn this off on or have help, um, that they can help you complete forms. They can be a full user or they can do everything. They can just work on adding the info to the form, but you are you have the ability only to submit it and actually send in things, or you can give someone access to just look at things and not actually submit or do any forms. So that would be up to you. Most of our libraries here in Nebraska, your small shops, uh, one person, uh, you know, not a lot of staff, and it's usually just you as a library director or one person who's designated as you be in charge of E-Rate. So uh, this is the homepage for USAC, uh, that usac.org slash E-Rate. And there's two buttons there that both say sign in that you can use either one of those to actually log into your account. The first thing that will come up is all this information about what you need to do if you are, since they have this new, what they call multi-factor authentication, MFA, which is a basically, if you've ever used um, some program, some online services now where they, whenever you log in on a new device, they send you a, a text message with a code or something. 
Um, that kind of thing is what this is. They've now instituted that for um, the E-rate system for Epic. Um, just, just extra security. Every time you log in, now you're going to have to log in with your username and password and then get this um, code and enter that as well. The first time you do it, you will have to go through this forgot password process here. But after you've done all of that and just set it up to begin with, you just continue and go on into um, logging in. So I'm just going to show you how that works after you've set it up. Um, you put in your username and your password, and you check the box to accept all the terms and conditions, and you sign in. However, when you sign in, it's going to say now you have to actually add have an email sent to you with an additional layer of security. So it's this is actually already pre-filled in there, that great email address. You don't enter it. It's just filled that in from where you had entered it here. You just sit, say, go ahead, send me the email and then it will pop up with a screen waiting for the passcode. Usually not even 30 seconds, you get an email that says, here is your code and enter it in there. If you don't get it, they've got a link there just to resend it. I've had to do that sometimes. I, I, you just never know. If you don't get it within a minute, just go ahead and hit resend email and it should do it. You will get an email that looks like this and this is not a real, this is a code from like is it back in August? So this is not a code to use. It's going to be a new six-digit code generated every time. So it will say, here's the code that you need to enter. You'll go back to that page, enter the code in there, and verify, and then you'll be able to get into your Epic account. So it is a multi-step process. You do have to set that up first, the first very first time you go in, but after that, you don't need to do that reset password thing um, and you know, to create it. You just go through the steps that I just showed you. And then you get to your landing page. This is your home page for doing everything in your Epic account. And we're gonna, I'm gonna show you some things in here. Um, we're not gonna go deep into everything. Like I said, this is the basics of E-Rate and how to do things. We are I'm gonna go through this pretty quickly. Um, I have, as I said, full training coming up. I'm just gonna highlight a few things on here. On this, uh, one thing to note in the middle here, and I'm zoomed in here, all all libraries, schools who do business with E-Rate, who work with E-Rate, are assigned a build entity number um, or an entity number. And your number, you'll find it right there in the middle of your screen. Very often, this, this will come up as this is kind of like a social security number for a person. It's the number for doing E-Rate for your library. Um, so if you're ever asked what that is, that's where yours is. Also, at the very bottom of the screen there is, of your landing page is this link to search. If you're wondering where where are your forms, what the status is, did I remember to submit that form, did it get approved or not, um, this is where you can go and look up all of your applications, all of your different forms. And you can look up any form you submitted, your 70, your 471, 46, and for multiple funding years going back to when they first started doing this in 2016. Um, here I looked at a 470 for 2021 and it came up with two that I had been I had done. You can see over here on the right the status, one's incomplete, one's certified. Certified means it's done, I've submitted it, E-Rate USAC has it. Incomplete, I have not finished this form, I might need still to go back and do, do some work on it. So that's how you can check the status of any of your forms um, that you may have submitted in, in E-Rate. Now you'll receive lots of notification notifications to what they call in your news feed. And there's a news option way up there at the top of the blue. That's news for everybody. That's not your news feed. To get to your library's news feed, this is a tip. You click on your library's name where it says welcome and whatever your library's name is. And then you have a news item there in your menu. And this will give you any sort of notifications from USEC that have come to you. So you'll see a lot of things say they'll send you this notification in, you, in your news feed. They're going to send you this update, um, this, this letter, whatever in here. That's where you would go to find your own personal news for your library. You have your own profile in here as well that you can update and edit. You click on the little silhouette head over there and then profile that pops up and profile. And this is where you can update your name, email address, et cetera, anything about you as the person logging into the library's account here. Um, there is a notification error message, whatever. Basically right here, it comes out and you says, hey, look, edit profile. Don't use that. As this notice says down here, use this manage Epic user profile button on the right, just a little tip. And this is where you can change your name, phone number, job title, address, et cetera. This is about you. Now, if you are, we have library staff that change off sometimes and a new director comes in. If you have a 
if you are a new director if you or if you're going to be switching to a new person to do this and they're still using the same email address you don't have to create a whole new account for them you can just go in here and change the name so if, for example if you have a generic email address for your library like you know um, you know so and so public library at gmail and the new director is going to still be using that so and so public library at gmail all you'd have to do is go in here and change it to your new name of the newest new director coming in and save that same email address and um, just update that if you do need to add a new account for that we can show you how to do that too if it is a whole new email address you can also manage your um, library's information in here on the upper top menu there manage organizations and you just check your library uh, for most of our libraries here in Nebraska, you are just a single entity. They have you check this this, this here because in other larger um, multi libraries that have multiple branches or schools that have multiple locations, you'd have to choose each location, which one you're talking about. So you choose your library, hit manage organization, and this is where this is very hard to read, I know, but I just want to show you this is long page with all the information about the library. Um, address, mailing address, uh, where they're located, all this other information. And I'm just going to zoom into some of this here to show you. So if you do, if your library does move, you do get a new building, you can update the um, address, the name of the library, phone number, um, whether you're urban or rural, if you move, if that changes for some reason, um, if you have other information you want them there to contact you. Uh, what kind of library are you? Public, private, academic, tribal, if it's you have a bookmobile kiosk, all that information you'd want to check here. Um, something I want to point out here too, I talked about your category two budget is based on the square footage of the library. This is where you tell USAC what the square footage of your library is in the library's organization profile information. Um, and something new, you need to have something in there in order for your rate to work for, from now going forward. Uh, it used to be, you just put anything in there, but um, it needs a number in there. You can see it actually has an asterisk now that is required field. Previously it wasn't. Um, so figure out what your footage is and make sure and update it into your library's profile there. Um, also, there's other numbers here, FCC registration number. This is, it will also show um, the school district that your library is associated with. I told you that your new school lunch numbers are what are used to calculate your discount. This is where you can choose what school district you are actually in. Um, it will possibly have one by default. If it's not the right one, you can always run a search and fix it. So that's all your library's info. Now, um, any questions about the profiles before we get into the forms? <clears throat> All right. Ah, yes. <laughs> Someone had asked, I see it asked for latitude and longitude. Yeah, it does. Um, that is for determining where the library is uh, for for where it's located for being urban or rural, it's another way of determining that. Um, it's just an optional way of doing it. We're using the urban or rural status determined by the um, by uh, the census instead. It's just it was another way that they had put in there that they could possibly do that. You could enter it if you want, if you know, but it's not a required one since we're just using this urban rural census data instead. There's a lot of um, leftover things, extra things. This was a new serve, new pro, new system that they instituted, and I think they put in some things that they weren't sure how they might use it. And there's some of the stuff is still there, but you don't have to use it if it doesn't apply to you. I guess is the way to say it. As long as you've got this urban or rural status marked correctly, you're good to go. All right, so um, we'll get into doing our forms now. It is getting close to 11 o'clock. I know our show usually goes 10 to 11. I did start a little late with my info about um, the pandemic and everything, but I'm gonna go as long as it takes for me to get through all the forms here. So we will probably be a little longer than an hour, um, but I'll go and keep recording until I'm done through all this. If you have any questions, you know, and you're, ready, you're able to stick around, great. If you do need to leave, don't worry, we are recording. You can always come back and watch this later. So your first form that you submit, which is actually available right now for 2021, is your 470. This officially um, opens a competitive bidding process and you're just putting out there saying to server um, service providers, we're looking for someone to provide us with this service, whether it's my monthly internet or equipment I wanna buy. 
Um, you start your form 470, and I'm not going to go through all the steps of the 470. That's for the full training. I'm just showing you where you get to it here in that upper menu on your landing page. There's this link for FCC form 470, and that just starts you out with inputting, putting in your basic library's info based on the um, library's profile, and then you would go through this form at telling them exactly what you're looking for. Uh, let's see. Uh, oh, we do have a question. So if you're only applying for E-rate at this time, not yet applying for the fiber assistance, you still need to go through this process you just went through. Um, yes. Um, the, yeah. The fiber is a special thing. The special construction fiber is something special extra that you can do if you want to, if you know you're interested in having fiber run to your library. That state match and that funding is actually, as, as, as I mentioned, available for the next four years. So this is the first year you can do it if you think you're ready to do that it's a major construction project that might need to be done so you want to make sure you're ready you and your municipality is ready for it if you're not sure you could just do your simple i just want a discount on my monthly internet costs that i'm getting right now and i'll start investigating new fiber over the next year and maybe do it next year and that's okay um, and you can do them separately. You can do multiple Form 470s if you want to. One, just to get your basic, I need a discount on my monthly costs one, and then go in and do a new 470, a second one that's just for your fiber, um, or that's just for my category two because I want to buy some new equipment. You can do multiple ones if you want to. So it depends on what you're going to be wanting a discount on what you would apply for. Yeah. Oh, you have to receive E-rate in order to qualify for the fiber. The, it's not about receiving e, e, the fiber. Well, yes, if the, the state match from the Public Service Commission is a match to an E-rate application. So, yes, you can't just apply to the Public Service Commission for that money to get fiber, and that's it. You have to first apply for E-rate, a 470, saying I want to get the service, and then say to the Public Service Commission, I've applied for E-rate, Can I? Also, I'm also applying for your match to my E-rate if I am approved. So you do have to be doing E-rate in order to get that fiber help from the Public Service Commission. Yes, it's all connected. Oh, that makes sense. All right. Um, so if you, if you want to know more about that, like I said, we do have other information on our um, other trainings we did, and you can even call me or email me or Holly Wolds, and we can even talk to you more about it if you want to really jump into doing that right now. So uh, the 470, after you get done submitting your 470, and this is what I was talking about of the things in your news feed, you'll get a notification of it. What's great about the 470 and the 471 and a lot of all this stuff, not it's not all in stone. If you make a mistake or need to make a correction or you typed in something wrong, you can always fix things. You, there will be ways to do that in there. What also comes up in this 470 um, is they tell you your allowable contract date. We are doing competitive bidding for this, and this is similar to if you've done um, bidding for a construction project or something major before. For uh, the FCC rules for competitive building, bidding for E-rate says you need to wait, give service providers 28 days minimum to reach out to you um, before you make your decision on who you're going to pick. So you have to sit back and wait for them to reach out to you and, and give you give you the quotes and then you can decide who you're going to go with so when you do your 470 when you get your notification it will tell you what is that actual date when you can make your decision and this is in your news and there is right there the allowable contract date for this particular one is 925 2020 that was when I did this example so um, that's an important date to know because you do have to wait those 28 days before you go on to your step of selecting a provider. If you don't wait you and you pick someone too early, you will not get your E-rate. You'll be dis disqualified from receiving E-rate. So you pay attention to that date. Um, so competitive bidding, this is a official, like I said, formal process that you may have used before when you've done requests for quotes or requests for proposals for the city. Um, where they will reach out to you. You may get emails, you may get phone calls, most likely just emails, mailings of providers saying, hey, I saw you ask for this E-rate, here's what we can give you. You can compare all these offers and decide what you wanna do after that 28 days has passed. It does have to be a fair and open bidding process. You have to treat everyone the same. 
the service providers cannot be involved in working on your 470, so you can't have a provider come and sit with you and say, okay, so put these in here, ask for these different things, and then I'll respond and I'll get your, and then you'll give me the, um, you'll award me the service. That would be highly illegal. You can't, I mean, you have to do this on your own. You can ask them for advice on, you know, if I did want to go with you, what would it be? What do you have available as services? What are the speeds and what are the costs? So you know what you're getting into. You can't say, it's for the purpose of doing my E-rate and then we're gonna work with you on this. It's just, I'm doing feelers to find out what's out there. So you do need to know what might be available. Uh, when you do choose your who you're gonna go with, you go with cost effective. Um, cost being a primary factor, factor, but look at lots of other things related. You can look at lots of other things related to this provider. Are they local? Do I um, know their service, their customer service is good or bad? Other things can go into your decision-making process too, not just who's the cheapest, because as you know, just going with the cheapest doesn't usually work out. <laughs> now, there's some questions I've had from people about what about certain situations? What if we already have a contract with a company and we just want to do E-rate for the first time, but we don't need, we're not ready to or needing to sign a whole new contract with them. You can do that. Just do a 470 as you were as if you were looking for new service. Um, wait your official 28 days and whatever contract you have in hand, that you now can consider a bid response. It's not necessarily that they contact you and said, hi, I would like to newly provide you service. It's just who you're already working with, and that can be one of your other one of your bids. If you did receive other potential contacts from um, providers, you would then have to compare it to them. But you can take into consideration in your comparison, not just the cost, but, oh, this is the company I know, or um, I know they've got great customer service and you're some new company from out of state, I don't know you. And that's a reason that is okay, val that is a valid reason to say no to a service provider in E-rate rules. Um, and then you can start receiving your discount on your current contract that you might have with a provider. Uh, if your city pays for internet, sometimes people have said, well, the library doesn't actually pay for it, so I can't do E-rate because it's for the library. That's okay. You just need to be able to separate the library's internet usage from what the city's is. But you can only get a discount on what is being sent to the library, that internet service. So some way you'd have to figure out, is there um, a guesstimate or do you know actual statistics that this this amount of internet goes here and this goes here, it's okay to guess, um, and then just apply for the library's portion that is paid by your city. Um, even though the city pays for the internet, they might have a bill that shows, oh, this was for the, the you know, the city offices, this is what goes to the library. They may trickle down and charge you something and something goes along with the budgets. Just look for that information and you can do, you can still do E-rate. It would just be for what the internet that gets sent to the library's building. What if you don't get any bids or only one? And um, so there is no competition because it's supposed to be a competitive bidding process. That's okay. There just wasn't a competition. <laughs> uh, you just say, yeah, it's the only one we got. <laughs> so uh, what's who we're going with? And we only have one internet provider. Um, if you didn't receive any, after that 28 days, you can then reach out to your service providers and say, hey, we're doing E-rate now. We put in the full application. You need to respond to me officially about that so that we can get the discount and make this work. So as long as you wait those 28 days, you're good to go. So after that 28 days, that's when you do your evaluation. You pick who you're going to go with, sign a contract if necessary, and then do your second form where you tell it, you, Zach, here's who we picked. But there's a specific time when you can only do your 471 called the application filing window. Uh, the 471 is, as I said, you just let USAC know, here's who we've decided on. Uh, and you do it after you've waited that 28 days, after you've signed a new a contract, if you need to sign something new, and during the filing window. The filing window is usually sometime in the spring. It usually falls sometime now between January, February, March of the time right before the funding year starts. So right now you can do your 470 and then you wait and get your bids, but then you've got to wait until the filing window opens to do the 471. Even if you tried to submit one, it won't let you in the system. It's gonna, it's gonna say, nope, it's not available yet. It's not announced when that window will be yet. It does change every year. There are not the same dates every year. It's just sometime usually between January, January, February, March, sometimes into April, depending on when they do it. They usually announce it sometime in December. So keep your eyes open to me. To I will post announcements. Um, it will be on our E-Rate website about when that it actually opens up. So you do your 470, 
you wait your 28 days, you pick who you're going to go with, and then you wait for the window for the 471. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> 471 is available in the same place on your landing page, just up there, there in the upper right menu. And it goes to the same thing as the 470. It opens up a page, starts automatically filling in your library info, and then you put in who you picked. You also receive a notice from um, about submitting this in your news um, feed. You can also make corrections to it if you want to, if necessary. After you've done your 471, that is when USAC will review your application. You yeah, sit back and wait for them to look through it. It can take months to do that. It, it's not going to be an instantaneous thing. They've got hundreds of thousands of applications that come in. Um, the group that does this in within USAC is called Program Integrity Assurance, PIA, PIA Review. So you may hear from them with questions. They will check and make sure your application is okay. If they think anything needs to be fixed, um, they will say, hey, I think you, did you mean this or not? You always have a chance to update things. Um, if they reach out to you, definitely um, respond to them. Um, if you're confused about what they're asking, call me, email me. They use a lot of what I like to call USAC speak. <laughs> very, uh, um, sometimes it can, they're very not clear about what they're looking for because they have to use certain legal terminology. But I can translate that for you if you need to. So if you do have questions asked and you're not sure how you're supposed to respond, email me, forward me their emails, whatever, and I can look at it and help you get through that. After they've made their decision, when you've, they've answered all your questions, you've answered all their questions and they think everything's good, they will then send you the funding commitment decision letter. This is <clears throat> the where they tell you if they've approved your um, E-rate application or not. Uh, hopefully it'll be approved. Uh, if not, it will say that. You might receive more than one, depending on if you've submitted more than one 470 and 471 throughout your process. Um, and if you have issues with it, you don't agree, there are ways to, to do an appeal, and I can help you with that if necessary. As soon as you submit, submit your, oh, your funding commitment decision letter will be emailed to you, actually. Um, this is something that you will get emailed to your, whatever email address you actually use to log into your Epic account, they will actually send you an email with it now. It's not just hidden, like you've got to go into your account and find it. So you're going to get an email that will be sent to you saying, hey, <clears throat> here's your uh, um, funding commitment letter. And it's attached with both a PDF and a spreadsheet there, as you can see at the top. And it is an actual letter. You just open up the PDF and it will tell you if it's been approved or not. And you have a lot of details about what is um, what they've approved, if they've denied it, if it's been a partial approval, that can happen too. So uh, you would have this sent right to you in your email. As soon as you get your funding commitment decision letter, if it is approved, you can immediately go and you should immediately go and do your next form in the E-rate process, the 486. This is where, for some reason, a lot of people lose it in the process of it. They've done their 470 and asked for service, they did their 471 saying who I've picked, they've heard back from E-rate and they feel, yay, I got my approval, I'm good. You still got to tell E-rate that you actually accept the funding, that you want to do it, and that's the 486. So even though you've got a letter that says you've been approved, you still got to say, thank you, I would actually like that money. Um, and what's great about this is, Everything you need to, in, in, to input into the 46 is already preloaded into your Epic account. You actually don't have to type in and enter or anything. You just have to check all the things that you asked for and say, yes, these are all I want. It autofills. It's one of the quickest, easiest forms to do, but it's where people kind of say, don't, a lot of people forget to do it because they get this great letter saying they've been approved and they sit back and relax. No, nope, still got to do this. Uh, it's also available in the upper right there, 486, right next to your 470 and 471. Something I will also highlight here, and I want to give you a tip on, after you've gone through the form and you're almost at the end of it, there are certifications. This, The 486 is where you actually certify and legally tell USAC that you are in compliance with SIPA if you need to. There are three choices for that, and you have to make sure you pick the right one. If you to pick the wrong one, you won't necessarily lose, not get your funding, but there will be a, a delay because it does, you know, if you're asking for your internet service and you said, I don't need to be compliant with SIPA because it doesn't count, then they're going to, it's going to hold up your application. So just read the wording here. The very first one says, I certify as of the date of the start of the services that I have complied with the requirements. 
The second one is I'm in the middle of, I'm working on complying. They do give you a couple of years to get set up, but for the very first time you do E-rate, you have three years to figure out how you're gonna do your filtering and getting it set up. That's the second choice. We are working towards it. The third choice is it doesn't apply. There are some small, a few, uh, cases where it wouldn't apply. Um, previously, when you could apply for a discount on telephone service, it didn't apply. But you got to make sure you check the right one. Oh, if you've been doing filtering and E-rate for a while, make sure it's the one that we are in compliance. If you're doing it for the first time and you're figuring out getting your filtering set up, you would do that second one where we are in um, undertaking actions to do this. I'm just highlighting this because this is a place where a lot of people have made a uh, mistake and checked the wrong box and then it delays their application. USAC will reach out to you. PIA will say, are you sure? Because you asked for something and you really need to be in compliance and they'll give you an opportunity to fix it, but it can take a couple of months to get them to get in touch with you about this. So just want to make sure you get it right. There is a deadline to do your 46. Uh, you do have only 120 days after the service starts or whenever you got your funding commission commitment, commitment decision letter, whichever is later. If your letter for funding commitment was done before the start of the, of the funding year, tw October 29th is a deadline. Um, if it was after that, then it just bumps forward based on whenever you did receive your letter. In the fall, which actually right now in October, I do pay attention to if you have submitted this. And some people did get emails from me last week saying, hey, you have not done your 46 yet for this year and the deadline's coming up at the end of October. So I do proactively look at your information, what's been submitted and reach out to you with an email saying, nudging you saying, hey, you need to do this. Um, USAC will also send you reminders if they notice that it, if you haven't done it as well. So hopefully between me and them, you shouldn't forget completely and miss the deadline. Um, after you do your 46, just like the 470, 471, you'll get a notification and a notification will be sent to your service provider letting them know you've done this. So they can start working on um, either getting your equipment to you, getting your installation done, getting the service started, and um, doing your discounts. Now, the last form in the process is um, about invoicing. This is how am I going to receive my, your, how you're going to receive your discount. And this is one where it will depend on if, how you're getting your discount, whether or not you submit the form or whether the service provider submits the form. You have, and you have the choice. If you want to receive a discount on your bills and your service provider will just automatically give you discounted bills to start with, you can, you will work with them. As soon as you, when you do your 46, after that's done, you will con you'll reach out to them at the same time and say, okay, so how are we gonna do this discount? And then the service provider submits this form, the 474, their, their service provider invoice then they give you an automatically just give you a discounted bill and then USAC reimburses them for whatever they've discounted you. So if you're getting discounts on your bills, you don't have to submit anything for this invoicing stage. You're done after the 46. So you have just three forms to do. Your other option is getting a reimbursement after you've paid your bills in full. It will depend on if your provider can do this or if the situation, you know, it, it means it has for whatever situation you need to do it this way. If you are doing it this way, you submit the form, the 472, and this is the bear form. You may hear, hear bear uh, tossed around a lot, build entity applicant reimbursement form. So you pay all your bills full price to your service provider, and then um, you submit this form to USAC, and then USAC reimburses you for the cost. There is a deadline for this as well, 120 days after the last service date, or the date of the 46 that you did. Um, it also comes up at the end of October. So the deadline for this for your previous year and for the and for your 46 for the current year, I'll come up at the end of October at the same time. Uh, I also pay attention to this and send out um, reminders to libraries if they if I notice they haven't done this yet, haven't according to USAC, don't USAC doesn't know how the the discount should be sent out. I will send reminders about this as well to so make sure you get your funding. This is a this funding is a direct um, reimbursement to you, to a direct deposit similar to doing when you get a direct deposit for a uh, paycheck. 
So they only do electronic bank transfers only. They don't issue checks they used to years ago, but now it's just direct um, deposit into your bank account. So you will have to, if you are going to be doing reimbursements after the fact, only if you're going to be doing that kind of thing where you pay in full and then get reimbursed afterwards, you have to do one extra form and you only do this once, the 498 to give E-rate all your banking information for the banking information for the library's account. Um, and you'll also need to know whatever your tax ID number is for the library or the city. You can get it from them for uh, that. Uh, to do your bear form, if you do need to do that, you actually do it through the same login that you log into Epic. When you log into Epic, you're going to have a choice when you first go in there of just going into your main account or going and doing a bear. Um, the bear form is still kind of They've got it through that security of logging in using that multi-factor authentication, but it still lives in its own location. We have to secondly, second, do a second login to the, they call it the legacy system, to actually do your bear. And this is what that login screen looks at, looks like. You will need a PIN number, um, personal identification number for this. If you've been doing bears before, you would have one. If you don't, you can contact USAC and request one, and then you'll be able to do your reimbursement form after the fact if you need to. So it does depend on which way you're going to get your reimbursement. Uh, you might get discounts on your bills. You might do a bear afterwards. Um, you might do a mixture of both, and that's okay depending on the situation. Uh, you will receive a notification, and your service provider will receive a notification letting you know if you did do that bear reimbursement. And you will get reports regularly, it's supposed to be quarterly, <laughs> from USAC about the funding they have submitted, put out to you. So if you are supposed to be getting discounts on your bills, check your bills, keep an eye on them, make sure it's coming through, and compare them to the report that USAC will send you saying, here's what we gave your provider. to dis you know, They said they were going to give you this much of a discount. This is how much we reimburse them. Make sure it matches up. And that's the last form. That's the last step of E-rate is that invoicing. Any questions right now? I know we went through a lot really quickly here, um, but this is just kind of the basics, a quick overview of how it all works. Um, do you have any questions right now? Go ahead and type in the question section. Uh, as I said, I will be doing the full workshops coming up soon. Keep your eyes open for my announcements about those. And in those sessions, I will do step-by-step -step going through each of the form, the forms so you can see how it works throughout the whole process for submitting all of these. All right. So some um, help. This is the our E-rate website that I've been talking about here at the Library Commission, um, lcnebraska.gov slash E-rate. Lots of resources and information on doing your E-rate. And there's lots of um, training from, even though I do my training workshops, USAC has training as well on their websites that I highly recommend you look at as well. They have their own self-paced training that you can go through. So if you don't want to wait for my workshops, because I'm waiting on USAC to give us some more information about that. They've got their things up there that you can go through. They have little videos, step-by-steps about each form. Um, and they even break up the form into the diff in different parts. Each of these videos are maybe four to eight, six, seven minutes long, so not very long showing you demoing um, how to go through all the forms and they have user guides instructions pdf so if you want to have like a piece of paper in front of you or a pdf up on your screen saying here's the steps and the screenshots they have that as well so definitely look at their website for those things um, on our website i have links to anything hopefully you should need uh, training information a timeline of how the process is um, previous trainings I've done, links to the Department of Education website in Nebraska, things you, you know, to help guides everything you might need for um, doing your E-rate. So take a look at that page there too for my information. If you do need to, you can call me. As I said, I am the state E-rate coordinator for public libraries. So my job is to help you get through this whole E-rate process. I will, as I said, I do the training. I will handhold you over the phone through everything. Um, I will look at your forms to, to confirm that you've done stuff correctly before you actually certify and submit. I will do all that. But if you need to, you can also contact OCL or USAC Client Service Bureau. That's their customer support if you need to. Sometimes I may have to refer you to them if I can't answer your question. Okay. Yep. And there is my contact information. Uh, you can call the 800 number here. They will pop you over to my phone line or email me. Um, 
at the moment, due to the um, pandemic, I am mostly working from home. I am here in the office just this morning to do the show. So if you leave me a voicemail on my phone, I get that as an email and I will listen to those and get back to you as soon as I can with um, to help answer your questions. So um, you won't necessarily have me answering my phone here um, right now, but I will definitely get back to every you as soon as I can with those emails. So any other questions you have about E-Rate? that you want to ask me right now. All right, well, I hope this was helpful for you. As I said, it is a lot of information. I will be um, providing this, um, this PowerPoint will be available to you also when I put up the recording, so you'll have access to all of this information afterwards as well. Um, yes, someone asked, did you say there'll be additional E-rate training? Yes, there will be additional training. I am, I usually do longer full full workshops, about two and a half, three hours. Um, I am waiting for more information from USAC from their side before I schedule my workshops, but hope they just told us they've, they're getting things ready. So hopefully within the next month or so, uh, you should see notifications from me, announcements about um, full E-rate training coming up. It'll be um, online only. I'm not doing in-person training this, this year due to the pandemic. Um, and it'll be multiple times and days so that people have opportunity to um, attend when it might be convenient to them so that they can have be able to ask me questions live. Um, there will be one recorded as well that will be available afterwards to watch too if, if not if you're not able to get any of them or if you want to rewatch something. So yes, keep your eyes open for announcements about my training coming up. All right. All right, so oh, let's get back over to the income slide page. All right, so um, that will wrap it up, I think, for today's show. We did go a little long. Sorry about that. <laughs> Erie does have a lot to it, but this is a quick overview of it. Um, like I said, look for my future trainings on that. Um, the show is been, has been recorded, and this is where you will find our archives. Right here underneath our upcoming shows is a link to our archives. Today's show will be at the top of the list here. They're just the most recent ones first. Um, we'll have a recording of this on our YouTube channel. And as, as I also said, I will have the PowerPoint presentation linked as well. So you'll be able to have access to that. Should have this done up by the end of the week. I will email all of you who attended and everyone who registered to let you know when it is ready. We also I also push it out to our mailing lists and our various social media and Compass Live. We do have a Facebook page. If you do like to use Facebook, you can give us a um, like over there and get reminders. Here's a reminder about logging today's show, when our recordings are available. Um, we post them on here as well. So if you do like to use Facebook, give us a like over there. On other social media, we do use the hashtag and Comp Live on um, Twitter, Instagram, wherever else our social media people are doing things. So you can keep an eye on our um, Encompass Live uh, things from there as well. Um, here in our archives, I'll show you, we do have a search feature here where you can search our archives for all of our previous shows. If you want to look for a particular topic, um, you can look for all of them or just the most recent 12 months. Uh, the reason we have this limit is because this is the archives for the um, entire history of Encompass Live. Encompass Live premiered in January 2009, so we have over 10 years worth of shows here. So if you are searching the entire thing, just pay attention to the original broadcast date. Uh, sometimes things may change, services and products may be different, links might not work anymore, some things might shut down completely since um, we did the show. Um, but we are librarians, we keep things uh, available for archives, so we always have these up there for you. Some things do stand the test of time, reading lists, certain ongoing projects, so just pay attention when you are looking at our archives here. Uh, so that will wrap up for today's show. I hope you'll join us next week. Our topic is for academic libraries, migrating, well, it's from an academic library, but could be useful to anybody, migrating to an open source ILS and an academic library, how to celebrate successes and bounce back from problems. Doesn't always go smoothly. Um, this is from uh, Colorado College. Tut Library did this, and uh, staff, uh, Carissa and Kate, will be on with us next week to talk about how they did this. So please do sign up for next week's show or any other shows we have coming up. We've got all our November dates booked, and I'm starting to get December dates up there too. So please do um, join us for next week and any of our future shows. Thank you very much, everybody, for being here with me this morning, and hopefully, we'll see you another time on Encompass Live. Bye bye. <laughs>